So I'm uh, from Manchester, but I was born in London. And uh, this statue here uh, is taken uh, from, the picture is taken from just outside of where I was christened when I was a baby. It's a statue of George and the dragon. So St. George is the patron saint of Britain, England, I should say. And it tells a story of him defeating a dragon. And today we're going to talk about how we defeat the dragon. So there is a dragon to be slayed. And the word of God says that war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. So over this series, we've been giving you kind of a theology of the kingdom. I've given you some verbiage and some language and some examples. But what I want to do this morning is give you a visual image of what it is that God is recruiting us for. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you imagine the small circle is the earth and the wider uh, circle is the heavens. Uh, the Bible talks about the archon the prince of the air or the ruler of the air, the enemy who has this um, ability to uh, torture, to create chaos, to uh, bring devastation, to bring death, the influence he has in the world. So I want you to imagine this kind of dark circle as that he has come, he's bringing death and destruction. When we turn on the TVs, we have to realize we're not fighting against political parties, we're not fighting against the Taliban, we're not fighting against all these different people who do these awful things. We realize we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but the spiritual force is the one behind it. So we have this awful picture there, but then suddenly someone receives the kingdom of God. And the wonderful thing is part of the enemy's territory is taken away. So when I became a Christian, when you became a Christian and the kingdom of God reigned within us, when we came under God's rulership, God's reign, some of the enemy's influence was taken away. Jesus said of himself that he had come to destroy the work of the devil. One of the, one of the wonderful things is even though God's rule is infinite, the devil's territory is finite. It has a limit. So the more that God advances, the more of the devil's work is destroyed. So then what happens is we become disciples, we grow, the kingdom of God grows within us, and more of the devil's territory is taken away. And then there's that wonderful day when you lead someone to Jesus. And that greater even day almost, you could say, when they grow into the things of God and more and more the devil's territory is taken away. And then we multiply, we spread, there's revival, we reach others for Jesus and more and more of the devil's influence, more and more of the devil's territory is taken away. And then they lead others and they disciple others. And then one day the Bible tells us the devil will be destroyed. It says, then the devil who fooled them will be thrown into the lake of fire burning with sulfur. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. This ends very badly for the devil. Full stop. There is no battle where we're, who's going to win? This ends badly for the devil. But in the limited time he has, he's trying to take you and I down with him. Why? Because he's terrified of us. Absolutely terrified of us. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. The devil has a problem, but it might not be what you think. The devil's problem is not that he's stupid. The devil's problem is that he's a slave to sin. He's the biggest of all slaves to sin. He will never repent. He is sinful, he's a slave to sin, he knows the end, he can read the Bible. <laughs> he knows what's going to happen, but that bitterness, that anger, that spitefulness means he wants to take as many people down with us as he possibly can. He wants to get us hooked on sin, he wants us to get us bitter, he wants what he has for us. And so he has a very simple tactic, first of all... Um, he tempts us. He tempts us. He tempts us. The word of God uh, says, no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And this is important because one of the tactics of the devil is to make you feel as though your situation is different from anybody else. Oh, well, this situation I've got right now, it's just different from anybody else. There's never been a temptation that is unique. 
except possibly with Jesus. There is no temptation you are ever going to go through that is unique to you. I would suggest the devil doesn't even know who you are because he's not omniscient. I don't know whether that's true or not, but God's omniscient. God knows us. The devil is not the evil version of God. He's just a created being. So he probably doesn't even, I'm going to suggest he doesn't know who I am. So he has these general tactics, first of all, to tempt you. So he does things like he's looking for a foothold, isn't he? So the Great Wall of China was built. It's a huge wall, very, very long, very, very high. It was never in its history broken through, but several times armies got through. Every time they got through, they would find one of these little gatekeepers, bribe the gatekeeper, and the army would go through. That's what the devil is, is doing. He's looking for a way in. He tempts us. It's a, an awful thing that he does. Um, and the problem with sin isn't just the sin, because sin can be forgiven. I think Dale Moody said, a man can get drunk, go out one night, fall over and break his leg. The next morning, he'll ask for forgiveness. He'll be forgiven, but he may walk for the rest of his life with a limp. We sin, God will forgive us, but the consequences of that sin may last a lifetime. But this is not his main tactic. This is just the precursor. His main tactic is not to tempt you, but to taunt you, to taunt you, to make you feel guilty, to make you feel disqualified to serve the Lord. He's looking for a way in. The word of God in Ephesians says, and do not give the devil a foothold. He's looking for a way in, a way to get in. The devil is a title, it's not a name. So um, Danny is a name. Uh, North American uh, Pays Director is his title. Um, uh, Joe Biden is a name. President of the United States, title. Lucifer is a name. Satan is a name. The devil is a title. What does it mean? Does it mean the great tempter? No, it means the great accuser. What the devil would say to you is this, become holy and then go. The devil would say that to you. God would say to you, go and then become holy. The devil is trying to taunt you. He's trying to get you disqualified because he's absolutely terrified of what you can achieve, of who you are, because you are the great dragon slayers. It says it in the word of God. And you are moving forward in the things of God. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We've got that in us. You've got that in you to bring destruction to the work of the devil. But it's hard to do that if he's already destroying you. So what do we do about that? How, how, do we, how has God helped us to destroy and overcome the enemy? He's a slave to sin. That does not mean you are. In fact, I want to kind of give you a little bit of encouragement here. Um, one, one of the problems we, we, we do is we have these kind of like basis of truth and then we extrapolate from that things that the Bible doesn't say. So, for instance, we know that sin um, cuts us off from the world to come. Sin uh, disqualifies us. We need to be redeemed. Um, and all sin is the same. All sin falls short of God's glory. But then we take from that things and we say, all sin is, all sin is the same. It's not. There are different categories of sin. I want to give you three categories from kind of Jewish tradition to help us understand something that actually is quite encouraging. So it's the first time you've heard someone preach about sin and encourage you about sin. But let me just go for it. So there are, there's a process, if you like, that happens. So uh, Pesha um, is a, a form of sin. It's a category of sin. Pesha is a kind of sin where you basically put two fingers up to God, as you would in England, or put the, give God the finger, and you basically say, you're not my boss, you're not my God, I'm going to do what I want to do, and for me, for my own selfish reasons, I'm going to go off and do these things. It's the act of rebellion. It's the things we do out of rebellion, the things we do because I'm my Lord, you're not. And then there are uh, a category of sins called A1. A1 is the kind of sin where you're leaning towards God, you're moving towards God, but you mess up sometimes. 
Yeah, no one's perfect, right? The only person ever to be born perfect and stay perfect was Jesus. So many of us will struggle with this kind of sin. And then there's a further type of sin, het. Het is the kind of sin where you don't do what you could do. Does that make sense? So uh, passion might be, I'm going to purposely deceive people to get my own way. A1 might be, I'm following God, but I was just asked the question and I kind of lied and I feel bad about it. And I know, I know I feel convicted. I feel I should do something about it. I feel bad. That's not who I want to be. Heck would be, I didn't tell a lie, but maybe I didn't tell someone the truth when I could have. I didn't go out of the way to tell someone. I had a great opportunity to tell someone the truth of the gospel, but I didn't do that. Does that make sense? Listen, we were born, if you like, in Pesha. When you became a Christian, you moved forward. Does that make sense? So it's all about the direction of your heart. Cavern is about the direction of your heart. We're moving towards God. We're seeing the kingdom of God worked out in our lives. We're seeing salvation um, grow. I said before, the devil would say, uh, become holy and then go. Of course, he doesn't want you to be holy. He's just going to get you, he's going to taunt you. He's going to say things like to you, it's okay to do that. You do it, it's fine. Other people are doing it and God will forgive you anyway. And then the minute you do it, it's how disgusting are you? What, are now you're going to pray? You're going to read your Bible now, you've done that. You're going you're gonna to tell people about Jesus when you just said that or did that or thought that or watched that. That's what the devil's trying to do. That is his main tactic, to taunt you, to make you feel so guilty you're disqualified from the kingdom of God. God would say, I'm not here to condemn you, I'm here to convict you. Don't know if you know the difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is, you did a bad thing, so you are bad and there is no hope. Conviction is, you did a bad thing, but God is good and there is hope. So if you ever feel bad and there's no sense of hope, there's no sense of light in the future, there's no way out, there's no path forward, it's probably not God. It's probably not the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts, he shows us the way forward as well. So there's a, a, a dragon slayer. But how do we go forward? How do we move on? The devil is terrified of you. And God is looking for knights. We said that knights are not crusaders that go and force people into their religion. But knights, in, in this sense, are role models, examples. So for many of you, you're working with young people. Young people are looking for role models who can show them what it's like to overcome the devil. What it's like to overcome the sin. One of the things I really dislike in youth ministry is the message, hey, there's one finger pointing to you, but there's three fingers pointing back. That's not rabbinical discipleship. Rabbinical discipleship is, I'm not perfect, but imitate me as I imitate Christ. And one of the things I feel the Lord's equipped me and we you with is this kingdom principle. So what's the kingdom principle? Well, the kingdom principle, um, I'm going to tell you that story later maybe, it says a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. In other words, stop trying and start training. Temptation is going to come. If you've not prepared yourself, you might get taken down. So we store up the things of God in us, so when temptation comes, we're strong. Our mind is in the right place. So who you want to be, you need to prepare now. You need to store these things up. It's not about being super spiritual. It's about storing up the things of God. It's a very practical thing you can do. The King James Version says, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So what's that look like? Well, let's, let's turn, shall we, to the cloud and the line. On one side, you have legalism. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with legalism. That's where uh, we use the law to beat each other up. We use the law to make ourselves feel superior from other people. I was, I was um, saved through a Pentecostal church that was just transforming from something that had been involved in legalism. So we're still coming out of it. So when I became Christian, uh, Christians didn't watch TV. Um, 
Christ, uh, Christian ladies always had to wear hats. Uh, Christian ladies couldn't wear makeup. They were told it was a sin to wear makeup. I remember a girl coming in with some lipstick on and the pastor said, the pastors had the best lines in those days. And the pastor saying, I see you've had your fingers in the devil's jam pot. That's what I remember him saying, which is a brilliant one-liner in my opinion. I used to look at all the women in my church and to some of them a lot I thought, it's, it's not so much a sin for you to wear makeup. For some of you, it's a sin for you not to wear makeup, which I know is really rude, but that's the way I remember thinking when I was about 14 years old. So, <laughs> but this is the point, is that there was a legalism and the, the, the devil bound us up. We were so busy looking at the line and working out what we could and couldn't do, we weren't able to go and advance the kingdom of God. Nowadays, I think there's an opposite problem. Nowadays, we have this liberalism, in my mind, where, um, and I'm not talking about in the political sense, I'm talking about in the sense where um, there was a move of God in the church, big picture, to get rid of legalism. But as per usual, we always go the opposite direction too far. So now, I'll talk to Christians who are watching things and thinking, how can you watch that? H how can you be involved in that? How can you say that? How, how is that okay? I struggle with things. I struggle watching the, you know, we have Netflix. It's interesting when we talk about the line because if you go on our Netflix accounts, uh, you'll see lots and lots of th uh, things we watch and they all have a red, red line. Some of them it completes, some of it gets halfway, some of it gets five minutes into it, yeah? And there's a bit where we're like, oh, too much. Too much bad language. Too much violence. Too much whatever it is. So we all struggle. We all can get so far and then at some point we get convicted, right? But, there, but even, I've got to be honest, there are times like, it's just gone so far the other way. It's like, mo I would say the majority of things on Netflix now I can't watch. The majority of things, I would say. It's not some things, I would say the majority of things. There's some great shows I'd love to watch, but I sacrifice my pleasure, if you like, for the sense of keeping my heart in the right place. So if it's not legalism and not liberalism, if it's not about just working out where on the line is it, what are we pursuing? Well, in the cloud, I would say there's righteousness. So what does righteousness look like seek first the kingdom and his righteousness seek first the kingdom and his righteousness James 5 verse 16 says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective so one of my questions then is well what is righteousness because in my mind with my upbringing righteousness was basically about being holy so in my mind if I was holy enough if I was pure enough, my prayers would be more effective. It's like a balance. The holier I can be, the more powerful my prayers. Um, in, in my tradition, church tradition, there's a historical character from the, um, kind of the war period called Smith Wigglesworth. It's a brilliant name, Smith Wigglesworth. Um, very popular guy, did amazing things. You read, I, I met one of his disciples. I met a guy who studied with him, who was mentored by him. He told me some incredible stories. He wrote a book about them. It's just amazing. My favorite story, he wrote some dramatic things that happened. My favorite wasn't the most dramatic, but I like this story. Apparently, Smith Wigglesworth was on a, on a train one day. It's one of those old-fashioned trains you see on, like, Downton Abbey-type things where there's a little compartment and three people opposite each other, and then you walk down the corridor, there's another little... So he walks in, and there's a, he sits opposite a guy who's reading a newspaper, and after, the guy, after a while, the guy who's reading the newspaper starts to fidget and then starts like, just throws his newspapers down and without Smith Wigglesworth saying anything, says, I can't stand it anymore. What must I do to be saved? I'm thinking, I wish I could do that. Just like look at people and go. And they just go, oh, I, need to, I need Jesus. Like, I, you know, in my mind, if I could get that whole day, that's what I would do. I remember spending, you know, when I, when I used to go to work, leave work at six uh, sorry, 7.30 in the morning, cycle for almost an hour to get to the place where I used to work, the shop I used to work. For an hour before that, I would pray. And in my mind, uh, which is a good thing, but in my mind, I had this simpli simplistic idea of the holier I am, the more effective I will be. And there is definitely some truth to that, okay? Definitely some truth to that. But righteousness is more than that. To be righteous means to be righted with God. To be righted with God. In other words, to be aligned with God. So righteousness absolutely it involves purity, but what it really means is to be aligned with God. So it's the same thing we've been saying all along. It's the same message. That God's purposes and our purposes are the same. Remember what Jesus said? If you pray in his will, 
you can move mountains. With a mustard seed of faith, you can move mountains if we pray in his will. So if our prayers are the things that he would pray for or he would want, we're going to see some amazing things happen. That's what it means to seek God, his kingdom, and his righteousness. Um, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. My question is, constructive to who and constructive to what? Everything is permissible if you're aligned with God because you have that covenant. So everything you've got, that awareness of God's presence and God's purpose for what you do. So this is a high calling, isn't it? This is, this is challenging for me. I'm sure it's challenging for you. But I love the word that um, you used, Erdogan. It's the thing we're reaching for. It's about the direction of our heart. It's where we're moving towards. Yes? Pesha, A1, het. We're moving in the right direction. Sin is not a breaking of rules. Sin is a breaking of relationship. Sin is not simply a breaking of rules. Sin is a breaking of relationship. You see that in marriages that break down. What's happening? What's the sin? It's a breaking of a relationship. So when we think about um, Christian-centric and we think about kingdom-centric, in a Christian-centric, when we look at the line, in a Christian-centric gospel, we ask things like, which movie rating is okay to watch? And how short can my skirt be? And how far can I go with my girlfriend? Um, if you're in youth ministry, you're probably going to get that. Some lad's going to come up to you or some couple's going to come and say, is it okay for us to, can we, what can we do? And it's going to get really awkward. Uh, my youth pastor um, once said, um, he gave me this advice. I mean, really he gave this advice, and it wasn't to me personally, but he gave it in, the, in youth ministry. He said, if you've not got one, don't touch theirs. That was his piece of advice. If you've not got one, don't touch there. Which is genius, but it's very much line dwelling, yeah? It's just, but that's where we are sometimes in our spiritual maturity. Um, whereas God might ask us questions such as, do you care about my reputation? Are you just thinking, well, I, I can do this. It'd be okay if I do this. Do you care about the reputation that's going to have in your community, in your youth group, in your church, in that school? Will you sacrifice to become strong? Will you not watch that program that you really like because you know, actually, it's not so good for you? Um, I think it was John Wesley who said, worldliness is that which kills my affection towards God. Is that program going to strengthen your faith in God or is it going to diminish it? Now, I'm not saying we should look at every program with that idea. You know, most programs are just programs, they're just stories. But, but there's some way you look at it thinking, this is going to make me feel guilty afterwards. This is not a good thing for me. This is not going to strengthen my faith. And I'm not talking about just things like um, language, sex, and violence. I'm talking about ethos. What's the ethos of the program? Um, mine, uh, the Foxy Lynn and me, our favorite kind of programs are um, true stories. True stories. In fact, at the end of a, a program, we always go on Wikipedia to find out what was true and what was not true. We always do that. And at the beginning, they say things like um, um, drama and characters and language have been changed for dramatic purpose. The truth is, language, people, things have been changed for thematic purpose, not dramatic purpose, thematic purpose. Every producer has a message. And in their program, even if it's fictional or true story, they will put their spin on it. You can watch two programs about the same historical events, but they have a very different message. So character, people, language is changed for thematic purpose. Worldliness is not just looking at sin or watching those things. It's allowing a worldly mentality to affect the way you connect with God. Is that making sense to you? So we might ask, these questions, but God would ask those questions. So how do we create, how do we allow the king, this kingdom principle to grow in our heart? Let me give me a very simple three-step process. First of all, create space. Create space in your life. Can I encourage you to proactively, with an awareness of God's presence and purpose, conduct some kind of inventory on the things you watch, the things you think about, 
the music you listen to. I'm not going to do a like, you know, don't watch this rated movie or that rated movie. and don't. But I want you, with the Holy Spirit, to ask the question, is this, you know, would Jesus be happy to watch this with me? You know, if Jesus was sat there on, the, on my right hand side, is he going to be okay with this? Now, we know that Jesus mixed with sinners, but would he watch it for entertainment? I think I said before, the law helps us to know where we're failing, but it doesn't have the power to help us succeed. But it does help us know where we're failing. And what will happen is after a while, your conscience will be seared. In other words, things that made you feel bad won't make you feel bad any longer. That is not a good sign in your life. That is not a good sign in my life. If things that made you feel bad once don't make you feel bad so more. Now, it could be it was just legalism anyway. It was just a man-made tradition. That's fine. But you'll know, I say before, I know, before you lie to me, you'll lie to yourself. Before I lie to you, I lie to myself. You'll know deep down, is this something I should be getting out of my life? Maybe there's a person who's constantly gossiping and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be that person's friend. I'm not going to ignore them. I'm just not going to listen to that. And when they start gossiping, I'm just going to stop them right there. Hey, let me just stop you right there. Listen to the hand girl. I'm already regretting doing that. Uh, but that kind of thing. You know, just, I'm, just don't, don't go. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in that. I'm not going to allow that to pollute my mind. So create space. Remove what is not beneficial. Remove what is not constructive. But then, and this is really important, really important. Fill that space. Fill that space. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. Um, there's a story in the Bible. Um, I'm going to read it to you. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was at first. Sometimes we clean up our lives, but we don't put other stuff in there. And at some point, temptations come back, and it becomes worse than it was before. So when you get rid of some stuff from your life, then think, well, what can I put in there? What's going to help me? What's going to grow me? What's, what's pure? What's noble? What's worthy? Um, I had a friend who said to me once, um, I don't pray. Um, I, don't, I had a friend who said to me once, I don't pray for an hour every day because I want God to speak to me in that hour. I pray for an hour every day so that when I'm having pizza at night, God can say something to me. So talk about practicing the presence of God. So we're practicing spending time with God and we're doing it often so we can eventually hear God speak to us. We're not trying in the moment, we're training. We're pra- Do you practice the presence of God? Do you get into his word? Spend time with him, pray, just spend time just listening, seeing if God gives you any mental images, seeing the things that God would say to you. Do you practice that so that some other time, in the moment, when you're not thinking about it, suddenly God can say something to you. So fill your life with good things. Don't just spend all your time beating yourself up, trying not to fill your life with bad things. Um, Let me read this quote. I rarely pray for more than 15 minutes. But rarely does 15 minutes go without me praying. Other way of looking at it. I like that. Thirdly, expand the space. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Um, Let me just talk very practically for a moment. So the great news is this. You're on the attack, the devil isn't. He is more afraid of you than you are afraid of him. He understands your potential more than you understand your potential. And he's terrified of you. Because there's no magic trick to being holy. 
There's no magic trick. It's not like you go down and once some, some pastor prays over you and suddenly you become holy. It's very practical. Everybody can do it. We store things up. We make good choices. As they say to kids, make good choices. We sacrifice things. And over a period of time, we grow in the things of God and we become more and more aligned to his purpose. And when we become more aligned to his purpose, a couple of things happen. Number one, our prayers become more effective. Number two, we become more anointed. Let me just about that and finish with that idea of anointing. Anointing is a wonderful thing. Anointing means when you do something, it doesn't become easier, but it becomes more effective. If you're anointed when you're leading people to Jesus, then when you led people to Jesus before and it was difficult, and three or four people came to Jesus, now you'll do the exact same thing, but more will come to Jesus. It doesn't make things more e easy, but it makes you more effective. Being righted with God, being righteous. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Thank you.